I'm curious, if you look at the Tesla mission statement, it's about transition to renewable energy, right? Which at like first sight doesn't seem to directly tie into self-driving being kind of part of wanting to transition to renewable energy. So can you say a bit about how self-driving and renewable energy play together? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. I think broadly, Elon sort of has a number of companies and a number of bets around just a higher level goal of uh, you know, making the future good, increase the probability of the future being good. You know, there, there's many aspects of the, to that, of course, and he's focused the Tesla mission around accelerating the transition to sustainable energy. Fundamentally, a large piece of this is getting people to transition to electric vehicles, and uh, we need to manufacture them at scale, and we want them to look like the future. And so the entire product itself uh, sort of looks like the future. It's a very clean design. And you want to be inspired by a progress in society and that things are developing in a positive direction. And so the car looks much more futuristic. And I think a big part of that also is that the car becomes, you know, it just becomes something magical in your life that can take you around in this beautiful future. And so I think autonomy really is part of just a broader vision to, to this future that we want to be part of where uh, we are driving electric vehicles with very little footprint and the society is sort of automated to a large extent. And uh, there's a huge amount of problems, of course, also around transportation and putting people in the loop with the amount of accidents that they get into. And also with the fact that uh, you don't want people to be really driving these cars because human brain is capable of so many beautiful things. Uh, so why should you solve the line following problem? That is not a good use of the brain. So not only is it unsafe to drive these cars, it's also just you want the brains to be doing something different. And so we have the technology to address this. So that's why we're working on it. Before we dive into the technology itself for self-driving, I've got another question at a higher level, which is, how is it working with Elon Musk? He might well be the most famous person in the world at this point, and you are actually working with him. Mm -hmm. What is that like? Well, he's obviously a very incredible person in many ways. I'm still trying to really map out his superpowers. He has incredibly well-developed intuition, I would say, in many aspects where he makes the right judgment calls, sometimes in what I perceive to be a lack of information, because he's not fully in detail of all the things, but yet his judgment is extremely good. I still haven't fully sort of understood how that happens. He has a way of taking a very complex system and simplifying it to just like the fundamentals and the, really the first principal components of what really matters about the system, and then making uh, statements about, about those. And so it's a very different way of thinking that I find kind of fascinating. By default, for example, sometimes I get sort of overwhelmed by the system. I feel like I need to know the system in its full detail to make the correct decisions, but that's not how he operates. He somehow has a way to distill the system into a much simpler system in which he operates. And so I think I've learned a lot about just how to approach problems. He's a double-edged sword because in terms of working with him, right? Because he wants the future yesterday and he will push people and he will inject a lot of energy and he wants it to happen quickly. And you have to be of a certain, I think, uh, attitude to really tolerate that over long periods of time. But he surrounds himself with people who get energy out of that. And they also want the future to happen quicker. And I love the energy of getting this to work faster, making a difference and having this impact. And so I really enjoy working with him because he has a way of injecting energy into the system, driving momentum, and he has incredibly good and developed judgment. So yeah, I overall just uh, really, really enjoy working with him. Sounds wonderful. Would you say you talk with him pretty much every week or? Yeah, that's right. So we have autopilot meetings that range from a week to multiple times a week, depending on you know uh, just how much scrutiny is being put on the autopilot maybe right in front of releases, we would have more than a week. And multiple times in the history of the team, it's been every single day. So yeah, on any of those frequencies, depending on what's happening. That's so exciting. Wow. If we think about self-driving cars, it's probably the kind of most tangible AI concept for the public because so many people have cars and it's how their car is going to change because of AI. Certainly one of the most written about aspects of AI research and application in the press. Not everybody really realizes how driverless cars and AI are connected. What is the backstory there? How long have people been working on self-driving cars? And what, what is the AI role? What, what, is, what is happening under the hood? Yeah, people have, of course, been thinking about cars that drive themselves for a very long time. Uh, some things are very easy to 
imagine, but very difficult to execute on, like driverless cars. Some things are not like that. So for example, a cryptocurrency in Bitcoin is, is hard to sort of come up with. So it's, you won't see something like that maybe featured in as much sci-fi. Uh, but driverless cars are something that people have been dreaming about for a very long time and working on for a long time. And I think fundamentally what makes it hard is right there, you have to deal with a huge amount of variability of what the world looks like. It's basically true that for AI and technology as it is today, uh, the degree of difficulty is proportional to the degree of variability you're going to encounter in the application. So the more scenarios you have to deal with, the harder it will be for the technology. And that's what makes this hard for self-driving cars as well, is that environments out there are quite variable. And maybe on the highway, you're just dealing with lane following. But once you get off the highway into city streets in San Francisco and so on, the amount of things you can encounter is very large. And designing to it is incredibly difficult. And uh, that's where all the action is. You hit upon variability, right? That's making it so hard. Can you dig a little deeper? Why does variability make it hard? Yeah. So like I mentioned, like when you're creating these deep learning systems, you are giving them some kind of a specification for how they should act in different environments, in different cases. So, hey, this is a cat, this is a dog. And the network starts from scratch. It's not like your human brain that is born into a three-dimensional physical reality where you sort of understand a lot of objects and you come with all these all this built-in hardware, but then also incredibly powerful learning algorithms so you can understand objects, object permanence and how the world works. These neural networks, they are made up of neurons like your brain. It's not an exactly correct analogy and it's misleading. These neural networks, again, it's better to think of them as a mathematical function with a lot of free parameters, 60 million knobs that must be set to get the correct behavior. And in the beginning, the setting of these knobs is completely random. So the neural net is implementing a completely random function. It's doing completely random things. And it's starting basically from scratch. And you have to tell it what to do in every situation. And the more situations you have, the more you're going to have to give it in order for it to do the right thing in all the cases. And so you deal with all this variability and you want this neural network to internalize that variability. What makes the neural network internalize that variability? What's, what's the solution to that? So it looks like we do it through roughly almost brute force ways right now. So if I want the neural network to function in millions of situations, I need to plug in millions of examples and or something on that order. So the neural networks do show some ability to sort of interpolate between the examples you've given them. They are not as good at extrapolating, but as long as you sort of cover the space of possibility and tell the neural network what to do in those different scenarios, they have some ability to interpolate between examples, but it's, it's limited. And so if you really have a massive amount of variability that you want the system to perform well on, you actually have to cover that space to a large extent. And sourcing examples where it's not working yet, is that when I drive my Tesla, is, am I sourcing those examples? How, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. So it's a great question. A lot of what I do, of course, at work is just curating these data sets. As I mentioned, that's where all the engineering now is. It's not people writing algorithms, it's people collecting data sets. There's lots of things we want to know about the scene, right? So we want to know where the uh, lines are, where the edges are, where the traffic lights are, where the other cars are, whether or not the car door is open on the car, if the left blinker is on, a huge amount of things. So roughly we have maybe say 30 top level tasks, but a lot of those tasks have many subtasks. Like for a car, you may want to know a lot of attributes about it. What kind of a vehicle is it? You know, is the car door open and so on? So you end up with a huge amount of predictions that your neural network has to make about the world. And now these networks are deployed in people's cars and they're running and making predictions. And then we have to come up with lots of ways to source inaccuracies. There's many ways by which we do that. Maybe one very simple example is if you intervene because the autopilot did not do something correct. Typically, when you intervene in a large number of cases, that has to do with uh, an incorrect prediction from the network. So an intervention is a trigger and we collect some of those images and then we look at them and we look at whether or not the predictions were correct and how were they wrong. And that helps us triage, should this example go into what labeling project and where should it end up in, in what data set and with what label. And that's how we sort of iterate on the system. Uh, but there's many triggers that are active at any point in time. As one more example, if you have a detection of, say, a stop sign or something like that, so you have a bounding box that the computer is putting around the stop sign, and if the stop sign detection uh, flickers, for example, so it's there and then the network says, oh, it's not a stop sign, oh, wait, it is a stop sign. When you see this disagreement with itself over time, 
that also is typically an extremely good source of data. So Flickr and temporally inconsistent predictions, or for example, disagreements with the map. So we think there's a stop sign, but the map says that there isn't one. So there's lots of different ways by which we gather examples where the network is mispredicting. And for us, it's an exercise of how quickly can you enter those examples into a training set. And that's a huge portion of what the team is doing. Have you ever had to sleep on a bench or a sofa in the Tesla headquarters like Elon? Uh, so yes, uh, I have slept at Tesla a few times, uh, even though I live very nearby, but there were definitely a few fires where that has happened. I found, I walked around the office and I was trying to find a nice place to find. And I found a little exercise studio. So there were a few yoga mats and I figured yoga mat is a great place. So I just uh, crashed there and it was great. And, uh, I actually slept really well and could get a ride back into it in the morning. So it was actually a pretty pleasant experience. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. So it's not only Elon who sleeps at Tesla every now and then. Yeah, I think it, it's good for the soul. You want to be invested into the problem and you're just too caught up in it. And you don't, you don't want to travel. And I like being overtaken by problems sometimes when you're just so into it and you really want it to work and sleep is in the way. And you just need to get it over with so that you can get back into it. So it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, I actually do enjoy it. I, I love the energy of the problem solving. I think it's good for the soul. Yeah. So I'm curious, what, what's your view on the future of AI when we think beyond self-driving? What are the big things on, on the horizon for us? I think like, first of all, like, wow, the progress is incredibly fast. When you're zoomed into the day-to-day -day and the different papers that are coming out on the scale of a week, maybe sometimes it can feel slightly slow. But when you zoom out, like AlexNet, as I mentioned, this, uh, this image net recognition benchmark that was beaten by neural net that really started the deep learning revolution and transformation was 2012. We're in 2021. So it hasn't even been a decade. And I'll get to live hopefully four more decades or something like that, maybe. Like from 2012 to now has been a complete transformation of AI. And a lot happened in a decade. And so if I'm going to witness something on those orders of magnitude in the next four years, it's really mind-boggling to extrapolate. And fundamentally, we have these algorithms that seem to be only up bounded by the data and the compute. We're going to get more compute, and we are specializing all of our hardware to neural networks, and all that is ongoing. Our current processes actually are not very specialized for running neural nets, and there's a lot of long hanging fruit there. And, so, and also, the size of the field has grown, and so there's a lot more brain power going into improving everything. And so there's this exponential like return on all of this investment in hardware and software. And so you shouldn't expect linear improvements. You should actually expect like some kind of an exponential improvements. So it gets even more mind-boggling. And so I think in the short term, we're absolutely going to see much more automation, be it self-driving cars or drones or warehouses. And that's very easy to predict. But I think on the long term, that's where it starts to get kind of even more dicey because I joined OpenAI. OpenAI is basically a AGI project, artificial general intelligence. So the idea is we're trying to develop uh, fundamentally a artificial brain that thinks and wants and acts and functions like a human being. Yeah, I, I think we're probably going to see some very exciting things come from, from AI because the technology is not really upper bounded in any like real way. And it's mildly concerning, but kind of exciting. So I think we'll see what happens. Andre, it's been absolutely wonderful having you on. Learned so much. Thank you. 